tons of chicken wings. I'm not a fan of who it's Monday night or you can eat wings because they're the worst. <laughs> the wings though, I like the uh, you can do a turn of sauce on them. That one's nice. That one is pain. Buffalo one's pretty good as well. Yeah. I was gonna say, but yeah, I went there one time and then ate a load of chicken and then instantly had to go and watch these guys play as the ice cream go. Whoop! That's right. In the crowd just like, this is so full. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 stop that. That's silly. Stop it. No, this is a very serious history channel. Very serious at all times. Good. Yeah, that's better. From high moor to deep cavern, from mountain peak to forest grove, the very centre of England is a land of mystery and wonder, of standing stones and citadels of old. The past lives on here much more than in most places. Few large settlements having grown up here over the years. On the southern edge of the Pennines, sprawling through Derbyshire, Staffordshire and beyond, this is the Peak District. England's very first national park and a place I've been visiting for over a decade. And of course, I'm not alone. Over 10 million people visit every year. Yet even so, it's still a remote, wild place. Little touched by the Industrial Revolution and the ensuing modern world. Unlike any other landscape in the English Midlands, the evidence of tens of thousands of years of human occupation can still be seen here on the landscape. From Mesolithic hunter-gatherers to chariot-riding Bronze Age lords. From Romans to Vikings. It's a land rich with legends and stories, some dating back millennia, studded with the jagged peaks of rocky outcrops, each one given a name. This is a place of intense, staggering beauty. But what brought me here this time wasn't any of the historic, architectural remains originally built by human hands, no matter how long ago. Though you can see my travels to many of these sites on the channel if you wish. But no, this time we're headed to a naturally occurring monument. Crafted by nothing more than water and the passage of time. So much time. 
largely unchanged throughout all the eons humans have lived here. Century after century after century. Predating every structure on the entire continent. This is Ludd's Church. Named for a Celtic god, first frequented by hunter-gatherers during the Ice Age. And visited all the way through the Stone Age, the medieval era, the time of the Victorians, to today. It's a place filled with legends, of ancient spirits and gods of old. Ludd's Church still speaks of that wilder, more ancient time when every river had a spirit, every tree a name, when magic still lived in the world. My name's Pete Kelly, and these are my mates, James and Frenchy. In the summer of 2020, crossing over the ancient border from Nottingham to Derby, one of those firmly held but ultimately pointless rivalries in the UK, we went north to have a look for ourselves. So we've just got to Ludd's Church. This is an amazing, amazing place. It's been a religious centre definitely since the medieval era. Possibly a lot longer. Ah, the summer of 2020. What a strange time. I mostly spent it in my garden, editing videos and spying on my cats. Five or six international trips cancelled. Archaeology conferences called off. And lots and lots of beer. I did manage to get out a couple of times though. And what better place to go than the Peak District? of the most historic landscapes in the UK. Let's go there, then. Keep going north once you enter this ancient land, and eventually you'll come to a place known as the Dark Peak. a portion of this already wild land. Here, in a place called Backwood, mysterious trees loom on all sides. Birdsong echoes out in the forest. And myths and legends are innumerable. Unusual rock formations can be seen throughout this corner of England. usually out on wild moorland and windy plains. But here, in the very heart of this forest, is something else. 
cutting through sheer rock and hillside for over a hundred meters, filled with bizarre stones and vegetation. This is Ludd's Church. Named for a Celtic god. Wet and cool on even the hottest of days. An entire microclimate, thousands of years in the making, has grown up here in this green chasm. Weird acoustics can be found, people far away being heard just as if they were right next to you. It's easy to see how stories became attached to this place. Much of the chasm has fallen into the River Dane down the long centuries. The latter a testament to the heavy influx of Norse settlers in the 9th and 10th centuries AD. This actually turned out to not be true. The River Dane is actually a Brythonic term meaning drop or trickle. Sorry about that. I just wanted a way to segue into Vikings really. Anyway, back to the video. By the time those seafarers arrived here, however, the land was already coated in Stone Age ruins, Bronze Age burial mounds, and Iron Age hill forts. The Romans left their mark too, with mines and great highways intersecting the moor. It is in myth, however, that the most famous story of all is found. For this place may well have an Arthurian connection. A story first appearing sometime in the 14th century, but with roots much older. describing a highly fantasized version of the 5th and 6th centuries. It's the tale of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Britain, a land of castles, knights in shining armour, and magic. One day, as King Arthur and his round table of noble warriors go about their business during the annual Christmas celebrations, a stranger arrives at court. Riding forth into the torch-lit halls of Camelot. This is no man those present have ever seen before. A giant, carrying a bunch of holly in one hand, a mighty battle-axe in the other. And soon, Arthur and his knights realise that this is no man at all. Though the tale differs ever so slightly in its various retellings over the years, one facet remains the same. Though mostly covered by shimmering armour, the newcomer is unmistakably green-skinned.
sometimes horned, monstrous in his appearance. To the horror of the court, the Green Knight issues a challenge, a test of the valour of those present. One of Arthur's knights can strike him once with his axe, but he will return the blow in the next year. Arthur, always the paragon of virtue and honour, immediately steps forward. Right, let me at him. I'll bloody nut him. But ultimately, his importance is deemed too much and another steps forward to take his place. One of the most stalwart of all, Sir Gawain. The young man steps forward and promptly, with one mighty swing of the axe, decapitates the stranger. To his horror, unbroken, the Green Knight stands tall, picks up his head, reattaches it to his body, and tells Gawain to meet him in exactly a year and a day. The location, a place named as the Green Chapel. It was this reference to the Green Chapel, a place described very much like Ludd's Church, and the identification of the tale's origins in the North Midlands that led 20th century scholar W. V. Eliot to suggest Ludd's Church as the key setting for the climax of the tale. Who wrote the story? Well, we simply don't know. But the language it was written in seems to have its roots on the Staffordshire Cheshire borderlands, not far from the Dark Peak. Though, of course, many other suggestions have been made over the years. Eliot's argument has received a great deal of support in the ensuing decades. As to the Green Knight, modern commenters have come up with all sorts of conclusions as to his origins, ranging from Celtic deities, the Green Man and the Devil himself. Over the year to come, Gawain is subjected to a series of tests of his loyalty and honour as he travels around the land, particularly at the castle of a local lord and lady where he is guest, and is subject to an attempted seduction. Wait, really? Is that all? Yes, it was written in the 14th century a society obsessed with chivalric values and being proper. J.R.R. Tolkien told me so. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Eventually, on New Year's Day, Gawain heads out to the Green Chapel to meet his fate, bending down to meet his death. The Green Knight faints twice before barely nicking him on the third. <laughs> Gawain is free to go. He has passed the test. Oh, 
Oh, what do you reckon that wall is? Please? Some walls, like on the hills and stuff, will be very old. Some of them in Dartmoor and stuff are like a thousand years old. Mm. Oh, cool. It is cool because I made it up. Mate, well, it could That's, be true. It though. is true. <laughs> <laughs> like walls, are like when it there's like true. so yeah. many over the countryside. Yeah, like yeah. That, it's like who's going to knock them all down? Yeah, and it's when they're in like inaccessible places, and they just like divvy, divvy a few farms. Like this is Hadrian's farms wall, just stay the it? same size. That's got. <laughs> Have you seen Hadrian's wall, mate? I've never seen Hadrian's. Is it wall. tall though? I'm... Yeah. No, it's it's good. It's impressive, man. It's really impressive. What, like, like taller than that? Yeah. Peter, we're twenty minutes into the video, and you haven't talked about any history yet. What? Oh, uh, oh yeah, yeah. You uh, you make a good point there. Right, I'll uh, I'll get on that. Oh, the only history is in the fifteenth century. Hmm. Here goes. In history, the first direct reference to Ludd's Church comes in the 15th century, when the place became a haven for a heretical Christian sect. Initially the followers of John Wycliffe, a Roman Catholic theologian dismissed from Oxford University in 1381 for criticism of the mainstream church. The group soon growing into an all-out proto-Protestant movement. In an age where non-conformity meant death, this was a very dangerous group to be a part of. By the 1410s, Lollardy, as it had become known, was widespread across the whole country. But, of course, a reckoning was on the way. In 1413, John Oldcastle, one of the highest ranking nobles in the country and a close personal friend of King Henry V. And gentlemen in England, now are bed, shall think themselves a curse they were not here. Was exposed as a follower of the new sect. Imprisoned in the Tower of London, Old Castle's future looked bleak. Yet he still had friends in high places and astonishingly, he managed to escape. Not content to disappear into obscurity, an insurrection was soon organised, including an attempted kidnapping of the king. Before long, however, the rebellion failed. Old Castle was captured, and along with hundreds of his companions, publicly burned alive. In the aftermath of the rebellion, any public sympathy for the Lollards soon died away, their persecution becoming ever more severe. In Derbyshire, one group led by a certain Walter de Ludank carried on their sermons in private deep within the dark peak at Ludd's church. There was a mole, however, and the authorities were tipped off. In the ensuing chaos, Walter was captured and many of his followers killed, allegedly including his granddaughter. In legend, it's said that she haunts the place to this day. Walter's ultimate fate? We don't know. But given the fates of other Lollards at the time, his capture doesn't bode well. The so-called Lollards Pit, just outside of Norwich, where thousands were burned alive, remains as a gruesome reminder of this time when religious persecution and dogmatic following of the mainstream church was completely normal.
By the 1860s, a wooden ship's head was placed high up in the chasm. And during this time, when health and safety regulations weren't exactly like they are today, a number of climbing routes continued to be used. Today, climbing is discouraged so as to protect the lower plants that colonised the dark rock faces. But every now and again, someone gives it a go. A wishing tree filled with coins stands outside the entrance. I wonder how long the coins have been here. Further down the valley by the River Dane, ancient stones hold up the hillside. And an even older bridge makes the crossing. We're headed back home now, but as always, when leaving the peaks, I can't wait to return. There are so many more adventures on the way. Any thoughts? Out here in nature? Mm. Not enough blue. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Pete Kelly. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll see you next time.